Uh, welcome to West Mesa High School. Welcome to National History Day. This is a great experience. Whether you use it to compete year long or whether you use it for your class, I do both. I'm that teacher who has to do both because I love this program immensely. I understand we had a little conflict with the other one. So how many teachers are brand new to History Day? Okay. How many of you want to do it in the classroom or extracurricular? Because there's two choices. So in the classroom. Okay. Extracurricular. Okay, and the rest of you here because somebody dragged you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, I'm Luisa Castillo. This is my school. Obviously, it's my school because I like it here. Okay, this is my classroom, so it's kind of busy, but that's okay. Welcome. You're allowed to eat and drink here. Bathrooms are next door. Water fountains next door. Um, the water dispenser does not work. They broke the sensor this week, so we have to get a new one. Bathrooms right next door. The teachers' bathrooms as well, if you want to use those. Um, all three classrooms will be right here in this corner. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. If I speak too quickly, I apologize because I do that a lot. So, okay, so here we go. We're going to start with National History Day. You should have picked up three pieces of paper out on the table. If not, we can grab them, okay? These are three different timelines. So the one that is two pages stapled, this is like NHD in the classroom. It comes from one of the teachers from Moriarty High School, Amy Page, and this is pretty much the basic outline she has for doing NHD in class. I have the one page front and back. I run it as a final project for first semester. So they have to do a project for semester that is related to National History Day, the theme, the rules, the whole 30 yards. But my timeline is different because I don't have a class that I can dedicate to that. So I'm fitting in these components in my curriculum and making it work. This is another one that we made a couple of years ago that is like the Bible because it breaks down by category what you're doing and what you should be doing pretty much for each one of those things. The major differences will be documentaries and papers, or not documentaries, websites and papers. They get turned in two to three weeks earlier before any contest. So regional and state, they're getting in turned in two weeks early. National, sometimes it's three to four weeks, depending what they have up there going on. So then you have to be prepared that you have to get those done earlier. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same thing. Okay, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, the PowerPoint is on the handouts. The majority of that information is here, so you don't have to write absolutely everything here. So on the one page for me, we're going to pretty much follow a lot of this stuff here. That stuff is on mine. And then the other one for Amy is a lot of that stuff will be on here. So you don't have to write tons. Okay, so National History Day in the classroom. Here we go. Okay, the theme in your classroom, the one thing we need to make sure that we hit on is that students understand the theme, and theme is different every year. So just because they did a great project on somebody last year, well, it may not work this year because the theme is different. So this year's theme is Breaking Barriers in History. As a group, I'm having to challenge myself to make it because this is the first time we've used this group, this topic. So the theme, so I'm like, oh, so I have to rethink how I'm thinking because I've never done it. Hammer the idea into your NHD theme lesson. So throughout the semester, I'm telling my kids, what is the theme? How do we make this work? They don't have any idea that they have a final project coming down the pike, though. Okay? Mm -hmm. How students provide theme examples in each topic of history study. It's best to brainstorm a bot, and then you get a really big topic. Brown versus Board of Education is humongous. What components of that are you going to look for? So you want to get to the small nitty-bitty. Theme activities. You will need copies of the NHD theme sheet and the essay. So with the exception of this year, there has been a list of subject topics that we can pick from. If you do a search online, you can find it from other states, including New Mexico, that has lists. I just print up a bunch of those. We take a look at those. Then we have the students. I have my students that make copies of the theme sheet that tells us what Dr. Gorn thinks this should look like or what the people in at the and nationals decide what that should look like and the theme they make sure they take care of a lot of items there's like the political the economic the social the religious this country another country all these different ideas that play into it and then have them read what that looks like in different things in philosophy it could be one thing in political science it could be another and this is a, usually a two two and a half page essay and it very clearly explains how the theme can tie into these different items so it's really nice. I assign that as homework. I make the kids read it as homework. They mark the text. They come back. We have a chat the next day so that they understand that. Then what we have them do is they get together, make a team, and then in small groups, we have them create a collaborative definition for the theme. So what does breaking barriers in history mean? What are barriers? Is it a physical wall? Is it a political idea? Is it a religious philosophy? 
Okay, what does that mean? And it can go anywhere. And then what does it mean in history? Just because it happened in 1920 doesn't mean it happened in New York City in 1920 and that's it, right? Well, what else is happening in 1920 in the U.S., in the world? How do all of these things tie into a topic? So we have them do that. And then as a whole group, we have them share the definitions, tighten it up, determine how it fits the theme, what may not fit the theme, or maybe somebody else missed the theme because we're not the experts in the classroom. History Day is not meant for me to be the sage on the stage. I know what the project needs to look like and the components it needs to have, but it's the process of getting from what are we talking about to, oh, I like this. Okay, it's nice to get it all done. Okay, topic activities. This is one that I do in class and Amy does as well. We divide the class into three teams. So random three teams, it doesn't matter how you want to do it. One, two, three, you just get the three teams. And then we have them pick a topic. So team one will pick a topic, whatever that is, and they will come up with every possible way that they can make it fit that topic or that theme. The other two groups are gonna rip that apart. They're gonna say, oh no, no, it doesn't work because of this and this and this. And then the first team has to present their ideas. Then of course they get questions from the other two teams. You pick one of the three teams, in this case it's always for me the third team that makes the call. They decide who wins. Then you switch the teams and you go again. So now two team will argue, and then teams three and one will debate and team one will judge. So you just rotate it so you get a lot of feedback on what will or will not work. And this usually takes, you know, 20, 30 minutes in a class period, depending how rambunctious they can get. Um, the theme, we do the same thing when it comes to write a thesis. We have them do that and um, Lynn is going to present you a great workshop on that later. So I'm just going to skip that. Okay. Source analysis. As a teacher, it's great if you create that PowerPoint yourself. Look for the definitions. What do you think those definitions are? And provide examples. It can be as simple as six or seven slides. It's not all that complicated. A little handout, that kind of thing. So that you do it. And then how do they look for clues? One of the key points is, is we need to teach them about primary and secondary sources. They think you can go online and hit Google and oh my gosh, it's Google and it's perfect and it's wonderful. And as adults, we know, yeah, no, not so much. Okay, we want to connect slides to them that show them what is primary and what is secondary. And it's nice to do that in different varieties. I'll have the kids bring in PowerPoints or I'll have them bring in primary sources that they think are. And I'm like, okay, and they turn them in today. And then I'll go tomorrow and I'll look it up tonight and I'll print out the real picture that is a primary source. So a lot of the times I'll tell them to look, I'll give them a topic and I pick boundaries of board because I teach US history. So at some point I got to get to it. And there's so many available images that inevitably some kid will find the one of the little girl and the lady sitting on the steps with the newspaper of the Supreme Court. And all you see is this, right? They're holding the document. You see it from the waist up their little faces. And they swear that's a primary source document. And then I pull up, well, what happened to the Supreme Court? Where did he go? And I'm like, that is the primary source. That's been cropped and looks pretty, but it didn't work. Okay, so they need to understand that just because Google has it and it says it's prime, it's not primary. Okay, so then for example, we have that and then also we need to teach them how to separate their primary and secondary sources and what exactly is a primary and secondary sources. Photographs are tough, okay, because they think any photograph is there. They think Wikipedia is God, okay, and it's not, okay, they do, but you know, you tell them. Wikipedia is really good at citing those primary sources. If you go to the link, you're going to find the link for that primary source. Or you go to the bottom and they have all these sources that you can look at. So Wikipedia is great to get like an idea, but I never trust anything they say. And I tell the children, Wikipedia tells lies, and if I catch you, you're all dead. Okay? <laughs> and they're like, oh. you know, go to the bottom. All those little tiny letters that nobody wants to read with the numbers, they have stuff in them. <laughs> So they'll go to those and find that. So we need to make sure that they understand the difference between LLC and narrow pictures as opposed to Google images, right? Do a little research to find the original. It's okay to find it on Google, but where did that picture come from? Okay, where did that come from? So for example, this is one of the ones I use in class. A primary source is a document or physical object which was written or created during the time under study. These sources were present during the experience or time period and offer an inside view of a particular event. Can we say all of these items are primary sources? As an educator, we know that, right? 
They think primary sources are only written letters or written books. They think most textbooks are primary and it's like they're not. Okay, so we can expand their knowledge so they understand that it's a little bit more than that. Original documents, where did it come from? Okay, where did they come from? In history day, it's okay because I teach in Spanish the majority of my day. A lot of my students are bilingual. They find a lot of sources that are in Spanish. Okay, so can we use those? Heck yeah, we can cite those in the bib. When we translate the annotation or the, the citation information, we put in there that it was translated by the student. So we have the original words in Spanish, and then we put what it means in English because we are fortunate to be able to pull both those items together. But they need to understand. Creative works, poetries, novels, music, art. If you're gonna do a picture on or a project on Picasso, you better have some art on there, right? I don't wanna read 30 pages of text and there's no Picasso on there, okay? That stuff's primary depending where you get it as well. You know, relics or artifact, a basketball from a famous basketball player, a brick from a building, all those kinds of things count. So they just need to understand that you can expand those artifacts we call them chotskis, even though they're not, they're chotskis, to put on your project. Does it add to it? We don't want it there just because it takes up space, okay? So, a photograph of these bottles during the bombing of Nisaki. These are primary sources, hands down, because they melted, right? But this isn't exactly correct, right? Somebody had to put these on a background to take the picture to make that. So, is it primary or is it not? Okay, they have to understand this was staged, right? This really happened, but it didn't really happen in this nice, pretty little picture. Okay, so sometimes it's good to trick them because I do it all the time. Makes them think. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you all the answers, right? Okay, questions on this section so far? Okay, nope, don't be afraid to ask. I can answer questions. Okay, here we go. Managing your bibliography as a National History Day Teacher of students who compete, it is not unknown to go to nationals with a 40 or 45 page bib, okay? That's not a joke, okay? That's pretty standard for a lot of kids in my program and those kids that make the top 10, top 20, top finals, that kind of stuff, because they do that. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've spoken to other people and I'm like, I didn't even do an annotated bib my entire college career. And these high schoolers and sixth graders and seventh and eighth graders are producing college quality annotated bibs. Until I started teaching history today, I didn't know what that was. And I have a master's degree, okay? <laughs> so the skills they learn, we need to be able to account for the bib. If a student is doing an individual product, then it's no big deal, the work is all theirs. But if they're doing a group project, I need to be able to manage who did what because in my classroom, I have to grade them accordingly, okay? As a group project for history day to compete as a year, the student needs to be held accountable. I'm not gonna do all the work because you're my best friend. I want you to go to DC if we get there. No, that's not good enough, okay? These students have to learn to work together and often I've discovered, as most <laughs> teachers have, working with your best friends, not the best idea, okay? Especially when you know your best friend is the biggest slacker in the world, okay? Because you're gonna be picking up their slack on top of doing everything else and history day in the classroom and outside of the classroom is not just an in the classroom thing. You know, Mrs. Page does it all week long, but these kids put in hours at home on the weekends and all that stuff. So you can't have your buddy who's just going to be there for fun, okay? Managing your bibliography. We do it in two different ways. You have an individual which in itself isn't a problem, but they still need to be able to hold on to that bib because losing your bib always happens two days before a contest. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. And it's like you have a meltdown in so many proportions, you have no idea, okay? And we've done that, okay? So they determine if they're gonna do a team or an individual. That is step number one. And a team is anywhere between two to five members. So it's up to the students to decide. You can do it in two ways. My students do it both ways because they like Google Docs. Personally, I think it's evil and it needs to go away, but that's because I'm old and confused with my brain, okay? But they do it in Google Docs. So they put it in Google Docs so they have a copy so that they have their own Google Docs of their own stuff. So if they lose the big document, it's just a matter of putting it all back together and it's okay. And we print them out for regional, we print them out for state, and we print them out for nationals 
even without taking them anywhere. So if we lose it or it goes gone in cyberspace because we know how technology is, right? We have that hard copy and then it's just a matter of retyping everything as opposed to reinventing those annotations because they're never as good the second time as they were the first time. We all know that. So we make sure that they separate them into primary and secondary sources. Again, it's crucial for them to understand the difference between the two. They need to create a new bibliography for each contest. So I will do regional um, vaccinations bib, and then we will save that again, and it'll become state vaccinations bib. So we have the regional version, and then we add the new stuff to the state version, and then the same thing when we go to the national version, just so that you keep that progression so you can see that the kids are doing their work. Make sure either way you need to share it with everyone in your group and you need to share it with the teacher. It's important for me to see. And by having them do it on separate Google Docs before they combine them together, I can grade, you did this part, you did this part, and you did this part, okay? Because when you do history day, in the beginning, everybody writes in their own style. But as they progress through the project, everybody learns to write at that academic level, which is better. So as they progress, it's like, oh, I don't know who wrote this. As a teacher, I can't tell who wrote it unless one person can't spell whatever consistently, incorrectly. But otherwise, it's kind of tough. But this way, they can print them out individually, and I can score each person individually. And then as the project comes together, it works. So individually, they're going to do exactly the same thing. Okay, and then they add it as we go. Okay, and what's nice about when they do the group at the very bottom is they peer edit each other's entries. So I'll have them print out a hard copy because I love to waste paper. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, trade papers and you need to grade these. Because after you've seen it so many times, I'm like, I don't see that I, I don't know what you're talking about. It makes perfect sense to me because we know how that is. So this way it's a fresh new eyes on them. And we have, I have a really good working relationship with our English department. So the kids will get their bib done a week and a half before regionals. And then the English teachers will rip them up. And then they'll send them down the week before. And then the kids are responsible to make all those corrections by the time we go to the regional contest. So they can see what those grammar errors are. That kind of stuff. Okay. I personally like to use, um, I like to use noodle tools more than, oops, wrong way. Sorry, guys. I like to use noodle tools a little bit better. So when you write an annotation, you need to explain what is an annotation because they don't know what that means. So the simplest version is going to be, it's three to four sentences that explains what you learned from the book. My biggest peeve is the book said, really? You got Harry Potter doing some talking for you or what? Because they do that. The book said, and I'm like, or the next favorite one is the book contains. You open it up and it's Hermione's bag and there's just stuff. And they're like, oh, Castile. And I'm like, what is it? Don't be telling me that. And don't tell me what your opinion is because I don't care and I know it is. So you have to work that out. So I have them create a group annotation and then we work through one of them in class. And the easiest way for me to do it is, this is our textbook, open it up. How do we cite this in MLA? And I intentionally give them an old version of MLA. MLA is acceptable as so well as Turabian. I prefer Turabian, but our school teaches MLA, so I teach them MLA. We use an old version of MLA because it forces them to look those items up as opposed to going to Easy Bib, and it says book title, year. No, I want them to see physically how that works. So I use an older version of MLA, and I give them a handout to go with that, and that's how we annotate that one book. Okay, so that they understand that. And then we come up with those sentences that say, how does this work? And we write it on the board. As a homework assignment, and they hate this and I don't care. I tell them, okay, now we've done one. You guys get to annotate, to annotate 10 books for homework. They all take seven classes. So there you go. You got seven books right there. Pick three books off the shelf at the house. I don't care what they are. I don't care if it's Harry Potter or the cooking book that your mom has in the kitchen, right? Annotate them. We'll come in the next day and we'll partner up and we'll switch up. And it's like, okay, well, how does this work? And what does this make? And what does this say? Does your description tell me what's in the physics book? Does your description tell me what's in the English book? And it's easy to do, but it's a hands-on exercise that they get to practice. So in my class, we do it this way because we're not researching yet. So this is done pretty early in the year and we're not researching yet in my class, but if you're teaching it as a class, 
then you should have a real book that you can work with that the kids can get that type of information. But it's always a great idea to start with a textbook because they know what's in it. They can come up with three or four sentences about what's in it. So that makes it easier for them. Questions so far? Do you recommend EasyBib or do you just do the... Okay. I don't use EasyBib ever because it doesn't teach them the skill as far as I'm concerned. So and by intentionally using an older version of MLA, they can't use EasyBib because when it comes back and it looks like that, I said, you guys went to EasyBib. How do you know? Because that's not the format I gave you. What about Google tools? I'm getting there. That's okay. my favorite and I'm in love. Okay. <laughs> uh, I have one more question. Yes, ma'am. Is this, is, will we get a copy of your PowerPoint or should we be taking notes? Um, only if I could figure it out and that would be an Ellen thing. Okay. <laughs> but I have it. Okay. okay. So yeah, don't write all this down. Um, so they have to be able to understand what a good annotation is. And then you get those kids who like think annotations are like half a page long and I'm like, what are you talking about? I stopped reading after the third line because I'm like, I don't care that these big words are here because you don't even know what they mean. Because, you know, they'll do it. You have to be able to defend this annotation. Do you know what this says? Well, what does that word mean? Well, I don't know, but it looked good. That doesn't work for me. Okay? And it doesn't matter what level it is. You want three or four good sentences that tells me what you learned and what's in this book. How did this help you further your project? And with any really good History Day project, they're going to come up with a stack of sources this high and only use this many. Because while these were nice to know, they didn't do anything for my project. I might have gotten smarter and spent 12 hours reading it, but <laughs> it doesn't improve my project. It doesn't need to go in the bib. Okay? So there's no reason to buff the bib because a lot of people want to buff the bib. The more sources you have, the better. There's no magic number at nationals. Okay? We have to remember that whatever they do at a contest, that project has to stand alone. It has to stand alone. I should be able to walk up to it and be able to get how it connects to the thing, how the analysis works, and how things move along. If I don't get that by looking at the project, then the bib isn't going to help you. Okay, the bib just backs up what you have on your project. So tips for managing the biblio. So good thing about Google Docs is that it automatically saves the information, but if you accidentally hit delete, it's gone forever. So that's a pitfall that we have to work out. Separate group portions keep students in accountable and it keeps a backup. Remember, we want to have a background for kid one, two, and three, and then we put all that together so we can be accountable. Sources should be updated weekly. Absolutely, positively okay. weekly. You determine how you want that to do. If you're doing it a class project, I would recommend each person has to do two to three new sources per week. The trick that I love the most is kids get a book. And yeah, History Day kids know what books are very well. And they like the stacks and they like to hold them, okay? I have them read the book and get the notes on it. And we have sticky notes that we use and we put them sideways for information and top ways for pictures because I've been around the block a while. And we have these big stickies and the kids will write their annotation right away and stick it inside the page of the book. That way, when it comes time to, because my children, no matter what I say, do not update their bibs every week. They come in on a Saturday and then knock it all out one day. And I'm like, oh, you people are crazy. But it's already annotated. So it doesn't matter who does the typing because it's already there. So the annotation is done for them so they can move on. Have your adults proofread your citations and your annotations. Again, our English department is wonderful. As long as we get it to them at least two weeks in advance, a week and a half, two weeks before contest, they will knock this out. And they're not nice. Those red pants are evil. And I'm like, here, I'll give you a new set. <laughs> because they're so good with it. Same thing for process papers. They'll do that as well. I prefer, prefer Noodle Tools. They have a 30-day free trial. They used to give NHD teachers a one-year free trial. I'm not sure if they still do that. I, ha I emailed the guy a couple days ago. He hasn't answered me back. What's nice about it is that it'll create a big biography for the entire group. And it, you can, as a teacher, when you make the group, because I make the groups and I make the passwords simple for myself to understand, and then I... Um, that way I can go back and check them whenever I want. You can determine what level of citations you want. Do you want an easier format because they're in 6th, 7th, or 8th grade, or do you want the advanced because they're in high school and that's where they should be? So it'll ask a lot more questions and they have to fill that stuff in. The students add the information directly. There's no problem. The program date and time stamps their information. And it tells me who put it in. So if I open it, it's going to say, Luisa entered this on this day at this time. 
so that I can go back and say, oh, well, you did 12 sources, you did 12, you did 11, that's good. We're all pretty much on the same page. Or why did you do all the sources here? Well, miss, I typed everything in, but look, this is his work here. And I'm like, uh-huh, that doesn't work because I can't account for it. So you have to do your own. Uh, the teacher, there's a little box on the bottom where I can make comments. I can say, what are you talking about? Because I am confused. I don't know what you're saying or what the point is. You need to work on this. And then what's really nice about Noodle Tools is that at the end, you can assign whether it's a primary or secondary source. It shuffles it for you, and then it pulls it all alphabetical by primary or secondary or however you want, and then you can just print off of that. So it works out. You have to download it and print it someplace else. So I'm going to show you a little Noodle Tools. Any questions? Do you assign a certain number of sources? I assign new sources every week. So they should be getting new sources at least two or three per week, depending on their projects and the topic. And I make sure that they um, they have a variety of them. Do they have a quota for, um, for when they <clears throat> submit their regional project? Um, like, do they have to have a certain, why is it not opening? Yeah, do they have, have to have a certain number by that time? Um, I like to have a round number of 20 to 25 for a regional contest because that, that shows um, usually half in primary and half in secondary. Okay, it's not. There we go. Okay, so this is what it looks like and these are projects that I've had from last year. So it tells you here, if I'm gonna to go to a new project, this is where you would start. And I would put in the name or the title of the project. And then I tell it right here, what kind of citation style do I want it to work? So it allows me to choose MLA, APA, Chicago, Turabian. Okay, when my kids go to compete, they have to do Turabian because it's just better for history day type stuff. And then the different level, do I want the introduction, do I want a junior division or do I want the advanced? I teach juniors and seniors, so of course they get the advanced and then I submit that and then it comes up with that citation style. So for example, this one tells me here, this is the name of this project here. They used MLA style here. They were at the advanced level, they had 77 sources, okay? This is the date it was created, this is the date it was modified, and then it gives me a bunch of options down here that you really don't need to have. Collaborating means there's more than one person on the documentary or the website or whatever we're doing. So I can take a look at this one. And I can ask questions, that kind of stuff. It gives me the, the name down here, and here's where I put the names of the students. So they have to make their own account first, and I usually just make it. That way it's just quick. It takes five minutes to make them. And then um, we put their logins here. It says they're a full collaborator. They can go in. I can take somebody off if they get thrown off the team or whatever. Okay. We can make adjustments here, and then it tells me who does what when they do it. So I can go to the project, or I can go to the sources, and this is one. That looks like it's a lot but it's only like three or four sentences. It's not just the way it looks at. So you can tell that this is a website. So when you key it in, you pick if you're gonna make a new one, it asks you what category you want. Is it a book? Is it a periodical? And it gets pretty complex depending on the level you set your stuff at. So depending what level you want, whether you wanna use all that stuff, they type in the citation. We classify this one as primary, right? They have note cards or not. There's all additional options down here. I have alphabetical up here. I can open this or I can do this by primary, secondary collaborator. So while we're working on stuff, it just goes alpha. Just alpha everybody and just before the contest, they'll change it to primary, secondary and then it changes that. So if you go down here, it tells you who did the sourcing and oh, lovely. Okay, it's just gonna cause me stress. Okay, so it just tells you what you need to do. So what's nice about it is you can copy this for whatever reason. It gives you the most modern version. So what tripped me out a couple of years ago was like if I have somebody from Library of Congress and then the next citation is from Library of Congress, it does those little dash thingies so that you realize it goes to the Library of Congress. It just makes me crazy because it doesn't work in my head. So when we copy it and put it into a Word document, I make the kids go back in and type in Library of Congress just because it confuses my brain, especially if they're on two separate pages when it prints. So we just fix that. That's not a big deal to change those changes. So if I want to take this and I'm going to go to primary and secondary sources, it'll take it and now it's by primary. It gives you the title here at the top and this will be the first source for primary. So then you take this and you print or export this. 
and then it puts it into a Word document format and then we just copy and paste that into a Word document and print off of that. So that's a little spiel on Noodle Tools. But what's nice about this is, and I can't get it to scroll down for whatever reason. It's making it difficult. Okay, so you can see right down here in tiny letters, this one was created by Vanessa on March 28th at 5.14 p.m. and then it was updated after that on whatever date. So this accounts for this student doing this work. So every time they log in, they log in on their own. They don't log in as a group account. They log in personally so that you can see it all. Okay, questions on this? Yep. So you said that you have your kids work in MLA and then right before competition, they switch to Chicago? They switch to Chicago if we go to nationals. So they go to Arabian. Oh, for nationals. For nationals, yeah. Okay. Do you think that gives you an edge at nationals or? No, but it's more historically accurate. Okay. So, and what I'm trying to teach these kids is that if you go to college, the professor is going to require Chicago or Turabian or APA. So, and most of the UNAM professors that I know at UNAM, they prefer Turabian or APA. So the fact that I've exposed them to Turabian already, because to me, Turabian is harder than APA. It's just harder to cite because it's very, very, very picky. So it's easier for them to learn Turabian, and then if you have to go back to APA, it's okay. But most of the professors at UNM prefer Turabian. Why do we do MLA then? I'm just curious. Because our, you missed it, our school advocates MLA. Okay. So that is easier for the English teachers because by the time we get to nationals and my kids get to nationals, I don't need anybody to proofread their bids. They can do it themselves. So the, the, those teachers want to go. Plus, we're already at school by the time we get nationals. We get out at the end of May, and we go to nationals in June. And if I have seniors, they're gone by mid-May. So there's no reason for them to do that. So they switch over to Turabian for nationals. But by that stage, they know what they're doing, so they can proofread their own stuff. But our school advocates MLA. I think that's everywhere, though. It might be. I don't know why, but they did. Hold on, let me get where we're at, guys. I think, hold on. I'm going Do you to have one. your students um, <clears throat> cite their own in a Google Doc no matter what before using Noodle Tools? Because Noodle Tools does sort of just do it for them. Yes, they have to cite it there. Yes. First in like a Google Doc or a Word document to where they know how to set it up before they do Noodle Tools then? If they use, um, if they use, if they're not going to compete, everybody does a Google Doc for, comp for a regular class project in my class. If I know they're going to compete, then I allow, they have to do it that way for the final project in December, but then I give them access to Noodle Tools, so over winter break, they can transfer all of those things to the Noodle Tools, because I prefer Noodle Tools, so it's easier for me to access. So they have to do both if they're going to compete. Um, let me find the page wrong, guys. Okay, so that was it on that. Any more questions on that before we go to... The in class, which is just a little bit different. How much time do I have? 20 minutes? 15 minutes? Okay, we're in good shape. Okay, so as I was saying, in my class, it's a little bit different because I don't have a class of National History Day. I don't have that. It's not allowed in the curriculum. I can't have that as part of my date. So my half stuff has to be extracurricular for contest levels. So in class, my kids will have to do a semester first project. So their final for the first semester will be a National History Day project. Now, as a new teacher or even as an experienced teacher, you can limit what that is. I can say the first few years that I did it, everybody's doing an exhibit. That's it. We're done. You don't get any choices. Everyone does an exhibit. We take the science board. Rather than having a six-foot exhibit, they do the science board, which is, what, three and a half feet, give or take. Everything has to be on there based on NHD rules. So they don't get any slack on that. Exhibits are easier for the kids to concept because they're used to making posters. Okay. Now, as I've done this 12, 13 years in the classroom, they can choose whatever their props. You can have a performance. You can have an exhibit. You can write a historical paper. You can do a website. You can do a documentary. But you know what? You're going to still follow these rules. And you've got six weeks to knock this thing out. Okay? So you can limit how you want to do that. But because I don't have the class, I have to teach the skills as I go. So come August, we're already working on tea building. We start school in the middle of August here. We work on primary and secondary sources. We work on plagiarism. What does that mean and what does that look like? And no, because you change five words out of a 10-word quote, that is still plagiarism because you're not doing the work yourself, right? This is all on this handout, honey. Okay. Um, 
in September, we start photograph analysis. We start talking about the NHD basics. What do those big things mean? You have to have these kind of word counts. You have to think about this. This is where I kind of introduced the theme a little bit. What do we mean? So when we're talking about barriers in history and we're on the Civil War now, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? What are some of the barriers here? You know, and whose position are we taking? Are we talking about the slave owner? Are we talking about the slave? Or are we talking about the guy from up north? Because what's the barrier for each one of those groups? So we do that kind of stuff. I have the students work in groups and individually because you need to figure that stuff out. You need to plan that out. And I rotate those groups throughout the semester. So we're going to do a group and I do this. Um, I went to a class this summer and they did it there. And I was like, oh, I did that already. I was so proud. Okay, so everyone should have a sheet of paper that looks like this. If not, I'll get you a piece of paper. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to fold the paper into thirds. Okay, just a regular little triangle. And this exercise will take about 30 minutes in class. It will take a bit. So you want to make sure it's done correctly the first time, otherwise it's a nightmare to fix later. Then we open it up and we fold it almost in half. I usually tell them to fold to about the hole. Okay, to about the hole. Okay, then at the top, I will tell them put the title of the whatever it is. So for my class, it would be U.S. History Groups. Um, for economics, it's Econ Groups. I do bilingual boot camp. It's BBC Groups. So whatever your title for your class is. And then I use the First Amendment to separate my groups. So I have speech in one box, press in another, assembly, religion, petition. So speech, press, and assembly on the top. And then on the bottom, I have religion and petition. And obviously, you can pick whatever five words you want. And in the last group, I have one, two, and three. Okay. So speech, press, assembly on the top. Religion, petition, and one, two, three on the bottom. Okay, so this is how it works, and you need to make sure you give the directions very, very clearly because they will mess it up. I'm telling you. Okay. So, for example, I need to find a group for speech. And depending how many students you have in your group, two to three has to be it. I prefer at least three. Sometimes we got to go to four because my classes are pretty big. So I have to find three people to put in the group for speech. So the first thing you tell them is you put your name in every box. So do that now. So I would have Castillo, 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 Castillo. So put your name in every one of these five boxes. Do that first because you're the first person of your group. This way they don't get confused later because it happens. Because <laughs> we know how students are. Now, it is your responsibility to find two other people in your group. So, for example, I'm the first person in my group. I'm going to have Kat. And I'm going to have this young lady right here. Okay? So, under speech, I should have my name, Kat's name, and this lady's right here. Okay, all three of us have to be exactly the same in this group. Everybody got it? So now that I have these three people in this group, I cannot have them in any of my other groups. Okay, so two things happen. One, my three best buddies are in the first group, right? Because that's who I love. That's hands down, right? And then the other people I kind of like are in the second group. And then by the time I get to the group, I'm going to go, oh, I can't repeat them? No, 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 no. So that forces them to find new people in the room, okay? So that's how this works. But you make sure that you have this. And if for some reason Pablo is absent today, I make Pablo's paper. And I'm like, guys, Pablo's paper is right here. Put him in the group. Put him in the group. Make sure you get him in some of these groups as well. So when he comes in tomorrow, I'm like, here's your group. Otherwise, he gets left out. And then it's a whole other nightmare later, right? And if kids are absent, you know what we have to do. We just make adjustments and call the whole thing good. Right? Then once we've done that, 
you get to pick your three best buddies to be your partner. But I want you to try not to get somebody you already have here. And in a bigger class, that works. In a smaller class, that's okay. You can have your best buddy, but you better pick two new people from the other side of the room because your best buddies are always in your corner. It's just the way it works, right? We know that. Questions on this? Okay, so what I want you guys to do now, because I want you to make a speech group and I want you to make an assembly group, okay? You're the first person. We need two people in each one of those groups. So you need to have three people total. Everybody got it? Okay, let's go. Let's make two groups. Did you get a picture? Sure. 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 Okay, so then the last little part of that thing is a lot of times I do partner work, right? So you're going to do the same thing and you're going to pick three partners. So this, my students have a binder that they have to maintain for class. It's on the shelves. So when I say, okay, we need to go to, what group did we do last time? And they will go, we did this. I'm like, okay, so now we need to go to this group. So I'm saying, okay, we're going to go to assembly groups and they're going to go, okay. And they'll look at the paper like, okay. And they'll get into those groups. It literally takes two seconds for them to pull the sheet out, look at it and figure out where they have to go. So they're rotating those groups all year long. And we keep this paper all year. So let's say somebody's absent and somebody's absent and each group only has two. Well, now you just became a group of four. Good luck. You know, it happens. Okay, so I'm kind of a little bit confused about this in the sense that is speech press, is that like the, the categories you use, are those the categories you want to examine doing National History Day with each group? I use that for generic? every group for everything. Okay. So when we're working on NHD stuff, then that's the group we use so that they get to, to look at each other's stuff and process. So then when it comes to November-ish, the kids are like, oh, I work really well with this one, but not with this one. And you know what? My best friend isn't the best person to put in my group. So basically, so this they use them. this to teach them what groups work best for them for National History Day. Right. But we also use those groups all year long for various group projects that we're working on or group activities or group okay. reading the text or whatever we're going to do. We use these groups all year long. So it changes, you know, it looks great when the evaluator comes in and he's like, oh, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, we need to go to these groups and the kids are gone. There's no counting and what number was I and no. You just make the work. So sometimes the, the caveat to this is at the end, sometimes says, miss, I only have one person in religion. I need somebody. Then you bring them back and it's like, who needs a religion person? And somebody's hand will raise and you pair those kids up right away. So it does take a good half hour because sometimes we have to clean that up a little bit. But I guess what I'm asking, so this is a tool to like figure out what groups work best, not necessarily, because at first I was thinking that you were like analyzing different aspects of sources, like mm -hmm. how, how does this source relate to mm -hmm. speech or mm -hmm. to the freedom of, I don't, I don't know. No, no, the, it's, I could have picked easily one, two, three, four, five, okay. whatever the content, so like my economic words are like uh, equilibrium price, supply and demand, or demand, supply, stuff okay. so whatever the, the words are for that class so it doesn't this is matter just a way for you to say okay um in your plans you're saying um i'm going to do group work etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is a way for you to say okay we're going to work on on these questions in the book for example whatever. so you need to be in your petition group right so they just look at their group and say okay so i need to find these two people so that we can be in our group together Correct. Oh, you don't waste Correct. a lot of time. I'm not wasting okay. time. I'm not counting. Sorry, I'm not, not looking at you. Yeah, okay. no, it's like groups are done. And I can use this for anything, whether it's history day or not, or whether it's regular content class stuff. We use these groups all year long. But it helps them determine um, what group they want to be in or who they want to pick for partners. Because realistically, in a classroom, I'm going to work with these people right here because I know them and we hang out all year long, right? <clears throat> I'm not going to pick the kid across the room because I don't know who they are. This eliminates that problem because they've worked with everyone. And there's community in the class, and that's crucial, especially for History Day. Especially for History Day. Okay? Um, I have just a couple. I think the difference that I have here is how I apply it in the classroom. This PowerPoint, I will make sure you guys get it as soon as I figure it out. Okay? I know there's a way to do it. So this is the exercise that we just did. I assign different things per semester that's on that little yellow piece of paper. This is exactly there, word for word, so you don't need to worry about it. We don't need to spend a lot of time on it. Um, we have December things that we take care of, January things that we take care of, February, those kinds of things, all the way through the end of the year. 
Okay, and then how we get through the nationals. There are some little links on the bottom that I have written up there for you guys to take a look at as well. Uh, we're almost out of time. Does anyone have questions? Uh, I, I just want to roll, I'm going to role play with you. Mm -hmm. uh, miss, I don't want to do an NHD project. What My kids don't get a choice because I teach juniors and seniors. Okay. It is their final project. And the final project for the class is 20% of your grade. That will change your attitude real quick. Can they opt out of going to the contest? They don't have to go to the contest. That's completely optional. Okay. So like in November when I assign this project, I will tell the kids, you're doing an NHG project. We have rules. You're going to follow them. This is the way it is. You need to learn how to research. I've taught you all these skills all semester. Now we're going to put them all together. This is your final project. If you're interested in competition or the contest, I need to have a chat with you. Because then that changes the focus I put on that group from day one. And I've already got three teams competing that they already know they want to compete. And what's the percentage of uh, average percentage you get to actually go to the contest? To compete, I usually only have like four or five teams. Okay. Out of three classes, out of 120 kids, I'll have maybe 15, 18 kids. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to do NHD. Yeah. And what's the, percent, what's the percentage of the grade for that final NHD project? It's 20% of their grade. Because at APS, we have to do 10 to 20% as the final. And I usually point it around 18%, to be quite honest. But yeah. Any more questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Good Thank job. You.